Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is uh, your host, Stephen Spector. With me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good day, Rob. Hey, Stephen. How are you? I'm, I am. Um, this, is our, this is our last activity before the weekend, so I'm, I'm excited to close out the weekend with the latest Shiny talk. And even though this is coming out, uh, you know, people listening to this, it's going to sound new to them, but I think today is the day the Avengers open. So I know I already have my tickets for tomorrow morning. So most likely, uh, maybe at the end of this, we'll have a whole discussion about uh, the Avengers. But our, our guest today is, uh, you know, another great guest. We're always searching for quality people, and I think we found them. Uh, Chris Short, who is the Senior DevOps Advocate at SJ Technologies, is with us. Chris, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, Chris, before we get going, we'd like our guests to just kind of give a quick overview of yourself and a little bit about what you work on so uh, people that aren't familiar with you kind of know your background as we start diving in. Great. Uh, yeah, so my background is long and arduous and painful, but I'll keep it as happy and light as possible. So I'm a senior DevOps advocate. What does that mean? Uh, I do DevOpsy things. No, uh, I help companies uh, kind of crawl, walk, run into full-blown you know, DevOps, agile, lean, embracing organizations. Um, you know, as far as you know, what I've done in the past, I have a lot of sysadmin uh, web application experience. The security side of things, I used to work in the Air Force doing a number of things with uh, them. And yeah, I've kind of been all around the world doing IT for, you know, since the dial-up modem days. So yeah, there's not much I haven't seen yet. So, so DevOps, DevOps, and DevOps makes sense. I, we've been talking on the show a bit about site reliability engineering, mm -hmm. uh, which which feels very DevOpsy to me. We like we love to talk about as as sort of interplayed. What's your take? How how do the SRE and DevOps work together? So, I think uh, it was Liz Fong Jones and Seth Vargo at Google say it best when like DevOps is being implemented by their SRE teams, right? Like it's not, it's not like there are two competing forces in an organization or two different methodologies. It's just SRE is kind of the numerical uh, implementation, the math behind uh, DevOps, right? So you can't just say, yes, we're doing DevOps. No, let's actually get like some numbers that indicate, you know, reliability and what we're observing and how those things are responsive. Um, so the, the mathematical equation behind DevOps, I feel like, is SRE to an extent. And SRE implements DevOps philosophies to drive, you know, the better outcomes that organizations need. You're saying that it makes sense, right? Isn't there a team aspect to it? Cause this, and here's, this is my dilemma with SRE. SRE is a group of people, the team implementing DevOps stuff. But DevOps is all about cross-organizational fit. Aren't, aren't, doesn't that create a conflict? Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, right? So most companies have a problem of, you know, silos, not just within their IT departments, but within, you know, across the board, marketing, IT, legal, nobody's on the same page. Um, and we're starting to see like IT and, you know, like finance working better together because of things like cloud providers uh, and large bills from them, you know, causing those two orgs to have to kind of, you know, get the same kind of shared common language. Um, yeah. SRE organizations are typically very tech heavy organizations to begin with anyway, um, unless they're, you know, the, the, oh yeah, it's the latest buzzword. You're now all SREs. And, you know, five years ago, they were all DevOps engineers and five years before that, they were all sysadmins. Um, so when you get uh, SREs, uh, you know, tight orgs, you get the, the the benefits of like software engineers and systems engineers kind of working together, which is always good. It's really the implementation of quote, SRE teams versus, you know, DevOps, for lack of a better term, teams. Um, that's where you kind of see the delineation, right? Like you're not really doing SRE right if you're, you know, putting those people in a corner and saying, write the software, deploy the software, maintain the software. Um, just like you're not doing DevOps right if you're doing that. So does that mean what, you know, the defect budgets or error budgets from, is that part of the equation from your perspective? Do you want to define that for people who don't know what, what we're talking about? Yeah, so let's see. You have, you know, varying degrees of budgets. And those budgets indicate, like, you know, you have done seven releases this year. You have gotten, 
you know, 70 minutes of downtime as a result of those, but your budget was 60, you're not going to do any more releases this year. Congratulations. So your, your, your error budget is, you know, uptime, you know, mean time to recovery, you know, any kind of metric you want to say, you can create a budget of that. Um, and that's kind of the SRE you know, mathematical side of things. So creating these budgets, you know, allows you, you know, typically I think the, the Google SRE book was like, yes, you have X amount of, you know, uh, error budget per month, I think was the metric they used. And once you go over that, you like, you need to work on stability and keeping things online as opposed to like feature releases. So, but, and, but it and also, then, it also, it also meant that the developers would, would, you know, there'd be a transfer back if mm -hmm. you know, of, of ownership or responsibility or time. Yeah. Like after a certain amount of time, Google, Google SREs would say, Nope, this is your problem. Now we're not going to maintain this for you anymore. You have to work on creating better stability of this you know, product or feature or whatever the, the thing that's it's being measured. Which made it a, which ultimately is a budget issue, right? You do less features because you've got to work mm -hmm. against, you know, my system's not reliable or it's not performant or it's not. Yeah, I mean, that works very well in an organization that like embraces that top to bottom. Uh, where it doesn't work well is when it's like, sorry, you're still maintaining this even though they violated their budget anyway. You know? right. right. And that's one of the things I liked about about the, the R part of like reliability engineering is that it sort of says features are only part of the benefit, right? Reliability, mm -hmm. performance, um, lack of toil, and, and toil strikes, and toil was the first, I like that word, I, I sometimes call it, say harm, um, mm -hmm. is like this. Um, but toil is where you're, you've built something and there's a lot of work maintaining it, right? That's sort of a, right. a big yeah. thing. Do you get involved in helping customers reduce toil? Is that part of sort of your definition of work? For yes. What you do? So I am very good at pointing out this is toil to people. Um, for example, if you know, so one thing I'm working on right now is actually verifying the deliverable from one unit business unit to another like the fact that that needs to be done is toil the <laughs> the deliverable should have been checked by the business unit delivering it way before it was like okay this is yours now um so business unit a delivering the thing should have said yes you have requested x y and z we have given you x y and z and there's not that feedback loop within that own business unit to sit there and say hey uh, you have delivered a, you know, poor thing, come back and fix it before you ever give it to, you know, business unit B, which is ultimately your customer. Um, so like identifying that as toil is, you know, another problem, you know, some security steps that some organizations put in place can be considered toil as well. Like, you know, you, you have, you, know, you have to do this, you know, form before you fill out this thing. Well, if the whole form process is automated, why do I have to fill out the form at all? Why don't you just go ahead and trust that people will use this tool correctly? <laughs> you know? So yeah, there's, there's, there's differing amounts of toil that exist for various reasons. And you know, those reasons were maybe valid a year ago or three years ago, might not be valid anymore. So that's where we come in and kind of help organizations out. So that makes, and that from a DevOps perspective makes a lot of sense because it's, it, you know, paying down technical debt, Mm -hmm. reduce the toil, but it's very hard to find the, the time to, to fix those, those problems, especially if you're going to automate them, right? That's a special, it's a special project, right? Actually, let me ask you as a question. So if, if I've got a lot of toil in my system, fixing it might be more than I can handle while I'm doing the toil. Yeah, um, right. That is a so, very common problem. Okay. And so you can come in, this is, a, this is actually a really good place to, to get management to spend some money bring in some outside help, reduce the toil, um, automate things, and, and then free up people in their infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, what I like to tell people is, you know, if you're a, you know, if you make, you know, textile goods, t-shirts and towels and things like that, like you're not a data center company, you're not, a, you know, a systems automation company per se, like your business model is very good at making towels and doing these things. Um, but, you know, if your IT organization is at capacity or, you know, is, you know, operating at 120%, like hiring more people to do that 120% is, is only going to help you break even, you know, you would need to automate some of those tasks. It's like you have automated your, you know, you're not sitting there with looms anymore that are operated by humans by hand. 
those are basically, you know, big robot manufacturing machines now. So you need to kind of help, you know, you, you didn't build those robots. You didn't install those robots yourself, just like you shouldn't install uh, the automation tooling yourself. You know, you should have an input, but maybe you don't have the time to do that because you are operating those things. This was one of the things in the, in the SRE book that I, I really felt Google articulated well, that if, you, if you're at 100%, you're never going to catch up. You will always get behind, which is why they talked about their 50% development rule, right? They're always trying to reduce their automate. They're always trying to reduce their toil workload through automation. And that required them to invest a significant amount of effort in toil reduction through, through automation. And otherwise they wouldn't get ahead, right? If any day you're not reducing toil, you're, you're falling behind. It's sort of right. the way they ended up saying. Security ends up feeling a lot like toil. Right? It's not well automated. It, it ends up having work that you have to do in front of other work. If you, if you add it, you're adding to toil potentially. Mm -hmm. Is there a way out of that trap? So that's, I feel like 2018 is the year of DevSecOps. Um, the term as, you know, a, a lot of marketing terms uh, get thrown out with Dev and Ops together, I feel like. But I think DevSecOps is a necessary highlighting of, you know, where help needs to happen in kind of technology right now. And the fact that you want to automate as much as your security tooling and implementation of that tooling as possible. In the sense of like, you should not be running your vulnerability scans at the very end of the software delivery pipeline, right? Like that's way too late. You've already spent all this time developing and coding and implementing these, you know, very complex systems uh, on top of already complex systems. Why would you wait to the last second to actually check it? You need to be doing that iteratively, just like you're doing your code work, right? Like very few people are doing waterfall, but if they are, it's because of, you know, X, Y, and Z. If you're doing agile and you're breaking pieces of code up into smaller, more iterative chunks to be worked on, you need to do the same thing with your security tool. You need to build that pipeline with those, those security checks built into it already. And that's really what we're focusing on this year with SJ Technologies is teaching people how to get that tooling in place and you know kind of just making the security organization comfortable with that is a huge huge gap that we have to you know work towards closing that presupposes that you're you're moving everything towards pipeline true is that is that fair is that a, is that what we should be thinking of it nowadays is basically pipeline infrastructure well think of it as an assembly ryan right like how many people are writing their own crypto libraries and writing their own you know libraries to interface with aws no they're just kind of gluing things together you know I, i'm from the detroit metro area i'm very familiar with you know car assembly pipelines not that you know I, you know the big three or anything are like great bastions of you know awesome it organizations but they're very good at putting things together and software nowadays is getting to the point where if you're like manually, you know, writing something that you could reuse off the shelf, you're kind of wasting a lot of time unless there's, you know, a very good legitimate reason for that. Like if you're writing your own algorithms, that makes perfect sense. But if you're writing your own libraries to like interface with things that are publicly you know, exposed anyway, why? <laughs> I, I laugh. I laugh because we, we have this, we, we, we have this conversations we watch on the bare metal side of what we do. We're like, that people still do, they still build their own. And it's sad because there's a lot of places industry wide where we seem to be repeating efforts. Right. Instead of doing collaborative, instead of fixing this collaboratively. And I want to, let me, I want to come back to that, but I, I want to go deeper on the pipeline side okay. uh, for a minute because five or six years ago, we were all excited about configuration management. And mm -hmm. People were talking about DevOps tools and, you know, yay, we can, we can build a machine and configure it and then keep it configured. And, and that momentum feels like it, it didn't take us to the right place. And now we're, we're talking about pipelines and building CICD pipelines and integration tests and things like that. Do you feel like that's a different thing? Is it, is it solving a problem in a different way? Is it, is it a replacement? What? So, you know, configuration management solved a very pertinent problem at the time. Uh, managing your infrastructure in your data center, your physical stuff, whatever that physical stuff might be, physical meaning could be virtual. Um, the, infrastructure, uh, your infrastructure. Yeah, your, your infrastructure, your operating systems configuration was better managed with configuration management tools. Going all the way back to CF Engine to now with you know, Puppet Chef Ansible Salt. Those tools still have a very good use case, but a lot of 
the infrastructure has changed to be where you can touch it with APIs. You know, if you need seven CPUs, 100 gigs of disks, and 16 gigs of memory, you can go get that from your own infrastructure with something like OpenStack or Pivotal or Kubernetes laying on top of it. Or you could get that, you know, through AWS, GCP, Azure. Um, so there's, you know, creating that ability to do everything through a pipeline solves a lot of those problems by implementing that configuration management and all the other things that need to go with it to create the API driven infrastructure. While it seems like you're glossing over those things, you're not like you still have to have all those things in place, right? Like you need to be able to deploy that API layer that controls your infrastructure, whatever it may be. And usually these, you know, configuration management tools are a part of that process. Right. But I, I do think that we've, you know, we've brought in a mutability mm -hmm. as, as a concept out of CICD pipelines to a high degree. And so the idea of patch manage a system is sort of been fading from a con configuration manager. It's more like set up a system, go, and then replace it. And so the idea of needing to, you know, the, where the complexity sh came in with all, with Chef and Puppet and Ansible and Salt was day two stuff. Pipelining, you know, do you think pipelining just more towards an immutable deployment where we deploy an artifact and we do less configuration? I, I, yeah, I mean, I would like to see uh, the lifetimes of systems start dwindling down into like hours. You know, okay. when I say systems, I mean your code running on X gets down to, you know, it's not going to sit there and deploy, redeploy over and over and over again in the same system. That system is going to be constantly being replaced and your code will end up running someplace you can't identify unless you go look at a log stream or something. The idea of having systems with uptimes measured in days or weeks or months is crazy to me. Like those things should be very short lived. And that's, that's a real, real inversion in an industry, right? People used to brag about their uptime. What you're oh, saying yeah. is, now we want to brag about our replacement rate, basically. Our, our yeah, we, rate. we want to brag about how quickly we can get new things out the door, right? Like when I say new things, that could be, you know, the heart bleed patch. <laughs> that could be, and I, I think that's kind of what's true. You know, right. I can talk about that further. I think these kind of earth shattering vulnerabilities have really made organizations say, you can't sit there and take six months to patch something. You can't sit there and take six hours to patch something at times, right? Like, you know, remember the, the worms of the early 2000s? Uh, yep. It took weeks to, you know, clean off your networks. And, you know, you would literally just turn everything off and say, yeah, we'll, we'll fix that as we can. And, you know, but everything look, else look, is running. Can't do look that. At the, look at the um, WannaCry vulnerability, right? Which was yeah. unpatched systems that, you know, very significant data security problems. From, from this, you know, lack, lack of your ability to patch infrastructure and... Uh, well, it's a, it's a lack of knowledge of what you're the, patching these too. Like, you know, this was like very old, like it wasn't want to cry like SMB vulnerabilities and, you know, version one versus version two, three, whatever it is. It, it, I mean, that's, that's like un, an unknown known in your network, right? <laughs> you should know that that thing's out there and it's vulnerable. And you should be working to fix that. One of the things about immutability is that there are a lot of people who don't like the word. They, they, they choke on it a little bit or they don't understand what we mean. Can you just describe what you mean by immutability and, and then sort of why you think it's important? So I, immutability is, in my opinion, you know, people have fears of it because I feel like they have a different opinion or knowledge of what the word means. Immutability is, it's essentially your infrastructure can become you know, just another artifact. You do not patch a system. You do not, you know, reconfiguration manage a system. You deploy a new image, a new container, whatever it may be, as opposed to modifying, you know, underlying infrastructure pieces. So for example, if you have, you know, a RHEL 7 box running, you know, Python code, uh, instead of, you know, upgrading, you know, Python XYZ package, you would build a new image and then deploy your code to that and shift load over to those new systems as opposed to, you know, upgrading image A, B, C, or D. Now you might think that's wasteful, but what ends up happening is you can package a bunch of those changes all at once and push that through, you know, your, <clears throat> your dev QA test prod scenario 
uh, more holistically. And, you know, when you start gaining velocity with that, you know, one patch turns into seven patches, turns into 12 patches, and you're doing that, you know, very, very, very quickly. And the cost of doing that goes way down. You know, you're, you're talking about immutability. I think people really overestimate how, how hard it is to, to, to replace an image and, and the performance hit. Mm -hmm. um, once you get the pattern down, it, it isn't that it's fast. It's not, it's not a slow process. Right. The idea of like having to maintain large repos to maintain patches and, you know, constantly have to roll out these patches during downtime and everything else. No, you have load balancers. You have a lot of tech that enable you to just swap things in and out very quickly. There's really no reason to sit there and wonder like, why can't we do X faster? You can, it, you just have to think more holistically about it. And I think people underestimate the importance of being able to move backwards in time also. Because right. what might seem like a really minor patch could break your whole infrastructure. And so mm -hmm. the fact that you can say this, what, <laughs> wait, pull back, go to, go to the last thing that was working. Um, that's really hard to do with configuration management. Yeah, like, you know, I'm, I'm working on a small project now to help people spin up uh, Kubernetes on Raspberry Pis using Ansible. And I'm starting to realize like, this might not be the best tool for this because, you know, if, if one thing changes in this whole, you know, bundle of things that get installed, you know, being able to say, you know, upgrade after that thing changes without having to blow everything away and put it, you know, back on, it's kind of like, how do I make that happen with a configuration management tool like Ansible? I would really just like to be able to say, destroy, recreate, destroy, recreate. But right. you can't really do that with Raspberry Pis very well. So, you know, because no. all the tooling is, you know, all the tooling is, you know, for x86 and Raspberry Pis are ARM and they're not even like ARM64, they're ARM, you know, whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to kind of get that going. And, and Raspberry Pis don't really have a Pixie Boot infrastructure. We've, we have people run up to us and are like, oh, we want to, you know, Pixie Boot Pis. I'm like, yeah, so do we. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, uh, Ellis, he works at VMware now. I think he's gotten like a Pixie Boot thing working on his Raspberry Pis. But again, it's one of those things that's very fragile, right? <laughs> one it's, it's, thing and it just goes haywire. Yeah, it, it Pixie, uh, I don't want to dive, there's, there's a whole technical explanation about why it could pixie they don't actually have pixie the way the real systems have pixie but mm -hmm. that's a whole nother podcast um <laughs> but we were so disappointed anyway um but yeah the, the ability to, to move backwards in time and, and you're right configuration management tools are really designed to patch systems they're not you know an ansible inventory system where you keep rotating the inventory file is gonna make you know you get very sad very quickly I wanted to jump back towards, oh boy, there's the scenes, there's a couple of places I want to talk to you still. Um, <laughs> I, culture, uh, before we jump into CNCF, and because you're a CNCF ambassador, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about toil and culture because I, I think that the toil that isn't shared toil is, <laughs> uh, is different than, you know, and maybe that's the DevOps. Can you, can you talk about the cultural aspects? So the way I like to look at it is, you know, your, your organization or your, your individual work center, whatever, however, you know, your units of work break down into like people management groups, like your culture is only as good as the like most awful thing that your, you know, best person or worst person complains about. So you have these toil things, right? And, you know, it's like, for example, you have let's say all of your people use Mac, except like this one person that uses Linux for, you know, whatever cultural reason. And that person has to do all these things to like work in your workflow because you use a lot of Mac centric tools. Um, that person's like satisfaction with their work is going to be a lot lower because they have to do a lot more to do the same thing you are. Now, some people say, well, why not just make him use a Mac? Well, that's a personal preference, right? Like people's tools, like you don't tell a carpenter, you have to use this kind of hammer or this kind of tape measure why are you telling software developers to say you have to use this OS or this IDE or, you know, for lack of a better term, this programming language, um, give them the tools that they're best at using and don't try and restrict that. 
because you would never do that to, you know, like a skilled tradesman, like, oh, yes, you use this kind of, you know, mortar and this kind of thing for this kind of brick. But, you know, we can't afford the good mortar. So we're going to, you know, we're going to be okay with you, you know, coming back every year and fixing this wall. Like that's a really bad kind of scenario to put somebody in. So toil and culture go hand in hand because culture makes people happy. Toil does not. Um, and if you have a culture that really kind of like doesn't help fix toil, you're really making people dissatisfied. And I bet you have a bunch of people that have been there a long time and then you can't get new people to come or stay for a while. So it's, it's almost, I feel like a, a Stockholm syndrome scenario to an extent because these people are so used to doing toil, they don't know any better. And then you bring someone new and you're like, you're, they're dumbfounded because they're like, why are you doing this this way? I think that's a really important point. There, there is a degree to which toil will fade into the background. Mm -hmm. um, toil becomes normal, right? Like it's just like, you know, uh, having internal certificates that aren't like publicly valid. So your browser just kind of freaks out and says, oh yeah, this isn't a good thing. You know, click, you know, here and then click advance. Like you're teaching people bad habits without even realizing it, right? Like your internal system might not have this really good cert. There's kind of no reason for that anymore because there's lots of ways to get certs that are pretty cheap or free for that matter. Uh, all you have to do is, you know, create DNS records. So if you're teaching people, you know, bad behavior, don't be surprised when that bad behavior permeates into much deeper parts of the organization, creating really big problems. Well, that's a really important point to think about. Do you think that that's a role for an external voice, right? Is there a, is there a need to have, be able to have somebody come through and say, Hey, this is toil. This is a place where we're just, just spot check you. How do you, how do you, how do you avoid that, that numbness, right? The boiling the frog problem with toil. Um, so it's hard, right? You have to, you have to be an organization that's willing to reach out for that outside help. So that's like step one. How do you convince people that they even have a problem? Um, <laughs> there's some organizations that I've worked with that, you know, we've always done it this way. Why would we change? And then all of a sudden years go by and they're like, Oh my God, we're getting our teeth kicked in. We're spending lots of money to keep this thing. That's always worked this way and has printed money for a decade for us. We spent a lot of money just trying to keep that online and we're failing at it. And why is that? Well, it's because the world has moved on and you haven't. So typically what happens is they reach out for help when it's too late or it's about to be too late or, you know, they, <laughs> if it's a large kind of, you know, industry, they see all these other people changing and they're like, Oh crap, we have to do something. And that's when they reach out. Well, if, if it's, you know, it, it's like when Andrew Clay Schaefer says you're either part of a learning organization or you're losing to one, like that's very true in every industry. Right. No, it makes a lot of sense. It, it, there, I've seen a phenomena uh, that I call the SRE half-life, um, Hmm. That I feel like you're you're articulating in a in another way, but it's this idea that you you hire somebody to come in, they look at their organization, and they see, you know, they're they're brought in to fix and modernize and change, and then, hmm. you know, most of the time I watch the behave the organization reject the change agent, right? Um, because they're asking them to make changes to things and and potentially too risky changes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you have an antidote for that? Is, is so, uh, and, and you know, I've, I've talked to John Willis about this. I've talked to, you know, people about this in general, right? Like I, I talk to my wife about stuff like this all the time. It's like, at what point in time do I throw in the towel and say, you're not willing to change. So I'm going to versus, you know, you know, versus just having patience at what point in time, is, you know, if, if I'm sitting there in every meeting and saying, I could do this faster if X, Y, Z were, you know, in place or, you know, these restrictions were lifted, can I get, a, you know, get enough momentum behind that before I give up, right? Like, do I, can I create enough uh, noise because the squeak wheel gets the grease? Can I make that wheel squeak, and squeak enough to create change or am I just always that person in the corner that's like, yeah, 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 yeah. he always complains. You know, if you've hit that point in your organization where you're always the person that complains or you're always talking to people that say no, that's when you know something's wrong. 
that's when you know something has to change. And it might be convincing, you know, your senior people to go to a DevOps days or some, you know, some small local event like a meetup, for example, to just kind of ask questions like, hey, how do y'all feel? If, if you've bought your boss the Phoenix project and nothing changed, then you're, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Time, to, time to get the resume out, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, there's, there's tons of books now you could throw at the CTO, your director, your VP, whoever, you know, like tons of books written by tech oriented people talking about business now. It's not like there's yeah. like one book. It doesn't even have to be the Phoenix Project. I feel like if you haven't read the Phoenix Project at this point, you're like way behind because you're not even willing to, you know, make a change that says, yeah, we're not doing as good. We're trying to learn. Um, so if, if you can't read another book like that, or, you know, find a book that fits somebody's personality better. Although the Phoenix project really kind of like the fastest read I've ever had of a tech book. Um, if you can't find a book that helps your organizational, you know, leaders change, then you're in a world of hurt. Makes sense. I want to pivot briefly to a small series of questions about Kubernetes okay. um, and CNCF. Um, and I, I, but here's the bridge. Because one of the things about Kubernetes is that it's it's sort of opinionated. It's um, very opinionated. And so, and, yes. and 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 so I want to I want you to try and square the circle for me on, you know, in a, in some cases we've talked about things being too opinionated, not opinionated. We have talked about immutability. You know, I, why 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 Kubernetes, and how how does it how does it improve things? So, Kubernetes does a few things very well, right? Like it takes you know, all these people that, you know, were writing everything, you know, their development pipelines are all, you know, in Docker because their developers latched onto Docker. All of a sudden they're deploying all these containers. And, Wait a minute, how do we keep all these containers in line? And how do I make sure that, you know, container A has the resources it needs in the same system as container B. And if that system goes down, where do they go to? Kubernetes solves that problem very quickly, very well. Um, and it's, it's, it has gotten reliable enough and enough adoption thanks to organizations like CNCF uh, and the work they're doing to kind of, you know, bolster it in the community and bolster it with organizations to well, contribute back. Um, it has gotten to the point now where, you know, people complaining about like etcd going down or whatever is it's yes, those are our valid concerns. Yes. Those are things that you have to manage, but at some point in time, you have to sit there and say, Hey, we're using this really kind of cloud centric tool. Why aren't we using this other cloud centric tool to back everything up? You know, there's, there's lots of Kubernetes backup tools now that exist. And if you're running, you know, cluster A, B, and C, you, know, you should have a disaster recovery plan. If A, B, and C is, you know, dev stage prod, then well, why don't you have like two prod clusters running that can just lift and shift everything over? You know, if you have to rebuild a cluster, it's not that big of a deal anymore, right? Like all of your artifacts, all your configuration should be backed up somewhere, be it, you know, GitHub or GitLab, whatever. So you know, the, the, the thing that it solves is those microservice functions and it's getting better, right? As more tooling comes out, managing microservices with Kubernetes is getting a lot better, a lot faster. And right. people are really building on top of Kubernetes to do the things that, you know, five years ago with Docker containers were impossible, right? Like you had no, no way to securely communicate between containers unless you, you know, created that SSL telling yourself. Now it's just kind of native. <laughs> We've done that, like yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's iterative improvement, right? Like, great, we've got VMs. Great, we've got containers. Great, now we can manage those containers like in a really effective automated way. What so comes it creates, next is- it's, it's, it's created some architectural opinions. Yes, and you know, Kubernetes is very opinionated, but it's opinionated for, I feel like good reasons because the organizations that are contributing to it and the people you know, that are, you know, people I talk to on a regular basis that are contributing to it have a lot of experience. So they're taking that experience and they're taking, you know, for, you know, large companies that are contributing to Kubernetes they are taking what their customers want and they're putting that into the product. And, you know, some of these, you know, SIG meetings, uh, special interest group meetings are, you know, they're not contentious or argumentative, but it's, they're very, very, very thought through. Right. So it's, you know, what about this edge case? What about that edge case? Should we not worry about X, edge case A, but do worry about edge case B? You know, have people seen people doing this in the wild? And if the answer is like, no, then that might not be addressed in this release or the next one or the next one. Um, 
but it is a very, very open and very large project. So there's lots of ways for people to get involved and contribute to it to make their edge case easier to do, use, right? Like round off that sharp point. Right. Do you see an ecosystem forming around Kubernetes? It's like a vendor, like vendors who are who are really successfully getting, you know, building their software for assuming a Kubernetes infrastructure or? Yeah, so I mean, you've got organizations like uh, Heptio and you know CoreOS. They were bought by uh, you know Red Hat, but you know I think Heptio is creating a, a grouping of tools and training and kind of implementations or reference architectures that uh, <clears throat> you'll start seeing more companies do. And you know, a lot of companies are helping people install Kubernetes now. I think you have Reactive Ops and a few other people in the space that are doing it. And it's going to get to that point where, you know, I remember, uh, what, you know, 1999, helping people go out and you know, patch for Y2K bugs. I would make a lot of money of that in high school. Um, you know, I would just run into an office real quick after school, patch a bunch of stuff, make sure, you know, it was Y2K ready, and then take my money and go. You're going to kind of have that now at a very, very large scale with Kubernetes, I feel like, because it's it's doing the things like immutable infrastructure, right? Like under the hood, you don't even have to worry about it because you're writing everything in a container anyway. And then you're saying, I need 40 of these containers always running on any of these systems. And they need these resources, just manage it for me. That's all I need. I guess I've been, wa I've been waiting to see software vendors too would basically write something that requires Kubernetes to be installed. And then well, they would sell <laughs> you a product that was a Kubernetes platform required product. Right. Uh, um, yeah. I haven't I, seen that as much yet. No, I, I agree with you on the installer market, right? And Heptio right. is writing packages around making Kubernetes easier to use, but they're not writing software that's... Um, the you know, prerequisite is Kubernetes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think there's resistance to that in general. I mean, at least from the people I talk to, um, you know, Docker should not be the requirement of your software which means Kubernetes can't be the requirement of your software either. The requirement needs to be, you know, the reliability, going back to our previous discussions, uh, of your software and of the packages you're writing and software you're maintaining. The, the idea of, you know, a container as a requirement, that exists because of a design decision that you made with your infrastructure, not because you know, your thing can only run in Kubernetes. I mean, yeah, obviously if you're dependent upon Kubernetes APIs, then your thing obviously has to run in Kubernetes. And there are some tools like that, but I'm not seeing people that are like, yeah, yeah, our OS can only, or our code can only run on Kubernetes. I think that's the antithesis of the whole thing. Um, and now you're, you're getting into a, a space where container runtimes are about to become, uh, you know, like change. They're just going to come out of the seat cushions and, you know, everything else is, uh, going to become relevant and you're just going to say, I'm going to write in this runtime for this tool and another runtime for another tool. And you're just going to manage all these things in an effective way and not worry about the underpinnings of everything anymore. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, to me, you know, right now I see people writing apps and they're writing the app. It goes to Kubernetes. They use Kubernetes to run their app. Mm -hmm. And then if they want a service, they go to a SaaS and they run the service I, I keep I keep hoping that we're going to see a class of applications that are, you know, there's actually a Kubernetes ecosystem on top, sort of like service brokers have, have become um, around, you know, in the in the Cloud Foundry and now Kubernetes space. There's you know there's service brokers as a product, yeah. um, and I guess the to me the next the next mark and you're just saying we're not there or maybe I'm wrong is is uh, that. Somebody will, somebody will sell you an application, you know, sell you ERP software or accounting software and say, this runs in your Kubernetes environment. We don't care how you installed Kubernetes. You, know, you, know, you have mm -hmm. to pass the test with Kubernetes, but we'll sell you a 50-person you know, seat license for our, you know, um, Rob's great accounting package. And, um, you know, and the prereq is Kubernetes. We don't, you know, we don't care because we don't care about the operating system. We don't care about the infrastructure anymore. It's just... Uh, Here's our service. Yeah. And I mean, there's, you don't see a lot of companies that are just saying, here's the software, off you go, right? Like you've got Microsoft, you've got Red Hat, um, but you're the, the, the number of companies that are saying, yes, we have this really great tool like you know, Quicken or QuickBooks or whatever, they're doing the SaaS stuff themselves. 
because the more of the environment they can control, the better it is for the customer. So you're, I don't think there's going to be, I mean, I'm sure there will be some tooling, but there's not going to be a huge market of, yes, this runs great on Kubernetes and that's where you should run it and you should run it yourself and we won't run it for you and you know, we'll support your product even though we have no idea what infrastructure it's running on. Or just because it's Kubernetes, we'll be fine, right? Like we might hit a point where that's the case, but I don't know if that's going to be a, a Kubernetes thing or something else down the line, right? I mean, huh. uh, the idea of, you know, Kubernetes as a requirement and we'll just give you the software, you run it yourself. I think that doesn't create great customer experiences now. I mean, we are living in an Apple world where we expect these nice bezels and, you know, these fine things and, you know, the software should just work and everything else. That's why I think SaaS has kind of jumped on because it just works. And if it's down, it's not working and they're working to fix it and you can't do anything about it. Wow. I, if that's the case, then, then the software industry as a non SaaS environment is dead because uh, Kubernetes to me is the last great hope that somebody's going to be able to write software for somebody to, to run as a licensed product instead of a SaaS. Um, yeah. I mean, so when I look at businesses nowadays, they have a SaaS product for accounting. They have a SaaS product for, uh, you know, payroll. They have a SaaS product for this. They have a SaaS product for that. Unless somebody is going to put all those SaaS products together and say, you all need to be able to run on Kubernetes because, and when I say somebody, it's going to have to be like a huge company, huge customer of these companies, right? Like uh, ADP, Imagine them getting told, no, you need to be able to install everything on on-prem. We're not going to use your SaaS product anymore. Like they've put a lot of money into their SaaS product. They're, they're probably still, you know, contributing to, you know, like that thick client installed in your own data center type thing. But that's a very big kind of monolithic app that them spending time to break that up and actually run on Kubernetes. They're probably doing that for their SaaS application, but they're not thinking about their customers running it. Wow, there's more questions I could ask, but I, that's actually, I think, a really good stopping point because I think that it's an interesting, hopefully the listeners thinking through what the implications are for the software industry and where things are going. Because um, I think that's a really big deal, but I, I think it also limits what Kubernetes is for. Um, right, it's for people who are, who are either writing software to be a SaaS or they're writing their own software to be a SaaS. Um, right. In, in that model. And I, I'm not sure that that's my, my preferred vision of the future, but I, I can subscribe to, to the, to what you're saying. So Chris, you've done one of the impossibles where Rob is not sure what to say next. I think ah. <laughs> it just doesn't happen very often. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> I, I'm not confident in, you know, anything I say, anything, change is always possible, right? Like never say never. Um, that, that is very pertinent to me, but the idea of, you know, all of a sudden we're gonna come back to everything being installed on premise is maybe possible. Uh, I, I, right, right now, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem like that's gonna be a direction. But, but I, I'm not even sure I want it to all be on premise. Premises. I, uh, what, what, what I, oh, what when I, I say on premise, I mean like your own infrastructure, right? Like you are- Right, but, 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 but here's, here's what I would hope. Okay. Because, because I'm, I'm a, a uh, we, we write software. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the independent software vendor mm -hmm. in the sense that I want somebody to be able to have a great idea, write it as software and sell it, t sell it in a way that, that doesn't mean that if I'm not running it in Amazon and your infrastructure is mostly in Google, I have now locked myself out of that market or right. If, if I'm running it out of a, uh, in China, then somebody in in Europe is going to have really a really crummy experience. And if I don't have a data, you know, if, if Amazon doesn't have the zone in the right place, I'm going to have a crummy experience. And this is even worse with Edge, and we haven't talked about Edge at all, and we don't have time. Yeah. But I I really want people to be able to write great software and not worry about it runs in US West or Google or Azure, but be able to sell you a software product that you can put next to your software products. And, and I, I, I hope that Kubernetes is a platform that enables me to sell you that or somebody to sell me that without now, it becoming an Amazon service. I think you're right in certain markets. like. China, I feel like that would be a very big thing. And that's because like China's kind of skipped 
uh, a step that we've gone through here in the, the States and Europe where it's very much been a, you know, kind of fast evolution. China's like jumped right into the global economy, you know, feet first, whole hog. And, you know, they're not going to have like these huge on-premise things. They're already in the cloud, right? Like that's where they started. So um, putting, you know, in an environment where everything's in the cloud, you don't have an on-prem data center to begin with at all. I think that's very possible. I think the idea of, you know, a lot of these SaaS industry offerings that have come out because of, you know, liability and, you know, legal ramifications of running your own things and they're not being patched. Um, you know, you're just, the, <laughs> the compliance and security laws and rules, things like HIPAA and things like, you know, the, the GDPR, it's, I think, well, GDPR is actually solving what I think is the HIPAA problem of, you know, security kabuki, where it's like, yes, we have a document that says we did this thing that says we might be secure. Uh, you know? Yeah, um, yeah I, I've walked into HIPAA organizations and found like customer data everywhere. So it's not like HIPAA is solving mm -hmm. any big problem. It's solving the problem between like the person sitting at the desk and the person, you know, behind you in line at the, the pharmacy, right? Like that's the problem it's solving. Um, it's not solving the data problem. So, Chris, I, I unfortunately have to do the cut. That's my job. No problem. <laughs> I'm going to be the bad guy. So, this is uh, super profound, though. I hope people got to listen to the end because we just took on the whole software industry. So, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll highlight that and say, you know, in the podcast uh, blog, the answer to all things software in this podcast. No need to listen to anything else. <laughs> Chris, if anyone's interested in uh, following you or looking for your information, where should they look? Uh, very big on Twitter. Uh, okay. Chris Short. Um, I also, I run a newsletter called DevOps-ish, I-S-H, so DevOps-ish, three syllables. Uh, I write that every week. That always has like a nice paragraph or two about, you know, thoughts that I've had from the week. Um, so those are two great places to, to find me, follow me, and communicate with me. Well, fantastic. Well, Chris, again, thanks for joining. And uh, I know, Rob, this was a, a good talk for a Friday afternoon. For us, uh, this is a good way to close out the week. So uh, I look forward, Chris, to uh, catching up with you again in the, in the future. Thanks again. Thank you.